Number 11. Fox dot dude says, what does Jesus mean when he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect in Matthew 548, wouldn't that mean we're all condemned since we sin every day slash week, as you say, Mike. Um, all right, Matthew 548. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And in this passage, uh, in this, let's, let's back up and see what are the things you're supposed to do. And then you'll be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So um, we'll back up a little bit more, a little bit more. Let's get a lot of scripture in here today. We'll start with verse uh, 21. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool will be liable to the hell of fire, meaning eternal judgment for, um, for a hateful insult. Um, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Therefore, excuse me, truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Listen to Jesus' teaching then on lust. So, so anger in the heart and, and mean words are have judgment consequences. They're, they're, they're sinfully bad in a significant way. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, that's true. Don't commit adultery. But Jesus adds and he says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, he's elevating things, right? Things are getting stricter. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than, than your whole body go into hell. And I have a, a teaching on this. It's not meant to be applied physically. Um, I have a teaching on this online. Just search, you know, Mike Winger, like cutting off your hand or something like that. Um, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. They thought, oh, the paper makes it okay. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard it said to those, uh, it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the king, the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. He's speaking here of the, I think, the abuses of oaths um, as a way of getting out of your normal yes and no. Well, I didn't, I didn't promise. Um, so speaking like that. The idea here is that Jesus is making everything more strict. Or perhaps he's revealing that everything is much more strict. Because God is perfectly holy. Let's keep reading. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, that'd be right. Here, turn to him the other also. And if you would, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now we come to the final one before the, the, the perfect statement. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who you love or who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. All right. The, the general thing in the, in the Sermon on the Mount is the elevation of what our estimation of what God wants of us is. The, it's elevating it. I want, Jesus wants us to see that God wants us to be what? Perfect like he is perfect. And to say that it's some lower degree of perfection doesn't work because we're being perfect. How? As our heavenly father is perfect. So we're talking about actual perfect, right? Like, like legit perfect 
perf moral perfection. Jesus wants us to, to be morally perfect. So he doesn't want us to have hatred in our hearts, lust in our motives, in our looks. He doesn't want us to um, have bitterness in our, in our, in our, uh, in our mouths right? You fool. He, he wants us to love those who hate us and persecute us, give to those who ask of us, even if, even those who are abusing us, in, at least to some extent, were to, were to yield and to, to be like Christ giving in. And they will be perfect. Like, like our father in heaven is perfect. The, the one thing I want to add to this for us to understand it is this is not a path to salvation. It's not that you have to do these things to be saved. This is the moral perfection God's calling us to. Do you see the difference? Son, you are adopted by the blood of Christ. But Christ also presents you with your moral example to follow so that you might be perfect. That's the, that's the difference we're seeing here. A, a high, high moral calling. We never lower our moral calling as Christians. We just don't for one second pretend that that's how we get saved. So wouldn't you, you, you said if we're supposed to be perfect this way, wouldn't that mean we're all condemned since we sin every day and week, as you say, Mike? And I would say absolutely yes. That is the point. One of the points. The point of looking at perfection is that you then reflect on yourself and go, I am so far from perfect. And then you fall upon the grace of Christ and you realize that Jesus is leading you to his cross where he pays for your sin, where he redeems you, where he restores you, where you're forgiven for what you've done. So Christianity has the highest possible moral calling upon its people and also incredible grace and forgiveness and that both of those things are together.